Welcome back. So we've already talked about Super Robot anime for quite a while. Let's move on to Real Robot Mecha. And I want to start with a factoid that may seem out of left field, but I think is actually really important. I don't know about you. Um, have you ever noticed like just how many Real Robot pilots are 15 years old? Like exactly 15 years old and when they're maybe a little bit older than that they have some big trauma from their past that is uh, causing them to uh, seem you know, older or more sophisticated or or just you know more serious more adult than their contemporaries why might that be well part of it is because you know anime is aimed at certain target audiences if you want to know who is the target demographic of an anime series, generally look at the age of the protagonist. It's usually a pretty good clue. So, you know, Gundam and other real robot shows are typically aimed at, you know, mid-teens, so 15-year-old protagonist. Fine. But I think there's a bit more to it than that. It turns out that until the modern era, a boy in Japan became a man at the age of 15. That was the age of adulthood. Ha. Huh. When you connect that with the idea of a 15-year-old acquiring a mecha, suddenly it's pretty easy to understand that the mecha is a symbol of oncoming adulthood. A boy is going along, is taking society's um, you know, resources, you know, consuming things, and then at 15 receives this mecca and then suddenly has a job to do. Suddenly has something that is you know, a responsibility to the overall culture and that boy is now productive, a productive member of society by fighting off aliens or what have you. And so the mecca is this very um, understandable metaphor for this idea of growing up. Don't know if you've noticed this, but Shinji and Amuro are not particularly thrilled about piloting their mecha. Why might that be? Because the mecha is a responsibility. It is not a weapon that you use to fight off bullies. It is a job that you go to regularly and use in, honestly, situations that often suck. Because being an adult sometimes sucks. Having to have these responsibilities, having to show up, having to do what you promised to do, all that stuff, all that these, those aspects of, of adult life are pretty clearly present in the mecha as presented in a real robot mecha series. Now, I should also point out, um, since I have these two up on the screen, remember that whole half-crazy inventor, scientist, father figure who gives his son the mecha? Yeah, about that. Um, huh. Oh, yeah. Hello, Gendo and Temray. Uh, that's pretty clearly, you know, that trope, but shifted around. Right? Um, in other words, Amuro's father and Shinji's father are both clearly inversions of, or at least definite changes to, the typical benevolent father figure giving his son the mecha. Whatever is the opposite of benevolent, that's Gendo Ikari. Now, this is also why both Eva and Gundam don't elicit the same reaction in modern fans as they did back in the day. Back when Gundam came out in the late 70s and Eva in the mid-90s, um, these were shocking inversions of the trope. Um, these were really strange versions of this father figure. And so folks were tuning in to Eva and being kind of blown away and fascinated by the fact that Gendo Ikari is a jerk all the time. That's kind of what made him interesting back in the day. Today we have a lot more examples of this father figure tropes, this, you know, this bad father figure trope. So it's not as shocking and not as, as noticeable. Um, so we just don't have that same, you know, reaction that they did back in the day. Just, anyway, worth noting. Um, oh, oh, um... Actually, Joseph Campbell has something to say. He's brought in here and he wants to, uh, to, to mention something to us. Joseph Campbell said, The first requirement of any society 
is that its adult membership realize and represent the fact that it is the next generation who constitute its life and being. In other words, the primary job of the current generation, the adult generation, in any culture is to pass on that culture to the next generation. Because if the next generation does not pick up those cultural values, the culture dies. Right? Or at the very least, is completely different than it was. And as soon as you realize this, large swaths of our modern pop culture suddenly make sense. TV shows, movies that seem strange, that seem out of left field, like why would you make this movie? If you see it through the lens of passing on cultural values, that's what they're being made for. That's what they're effectively doing. But Kemba wasn't done. Moreover, in the modern world, we ask our young not to remain on some proven level of earlier biology and sociology, but to represent a movement of the species forward. In other words, in the old myths, the heroes want Odysseus in the Odyssey got through the Odyssey by being a model Greek, by exemplifying the cultural values of Greek society. Beowulf defeated the monsters by being a model sort of Nordic Scandinavian warrior. Not so today. Old myths are about the past. The new myths, and particularly Mecca, must be about the future about changing things. Oh. This is why Mecca is such an important thing for us today. This is why Mecca is speaking to us today. Um, to give you a, a, an idea of how interesting and how different this is, the Harry Potter books are actually quite conservative. And I do not mean that in the political sense. I mean that as soon as Harry Potter discovers the wizarding world and discovers it's under threat, that it's going to change, the next seven books are about Harry Potter trying to get things back to the way they were before, restoring things to the way things used to be. Right? Now, to be clear, every culture has some things that need to change and some things that need to be preserved, some things that should not change. Uh, we currently live in a society that is very polarized around uh, looking for one or the other of those all the time. And the reality is we're always doing both in a healthy society. Um, Harry Potter is about celebrating that preservation instinct, that, that desire to preserve, that some things do need to be preserved. Um, and it is a story about that. Mecca takes a different tack and is looking at a different perspective on things. The hero in a Mecca series is typically, and particularly a real robot Mecca series, it simply provides a new perspective on the situation that the characters are in. Indeed, the protagonist is often at odds with the existing power structure. The protagonist does not agree with the existing culture about the way things should be. That is very, very unusual from a mythic perspective. Usually the hero does not talk back to the king. You know, um, Beowulf does not argue with Hrothgar. Um, you know, the heroes are there to preserve and maintain and continue things as they have always been in the old ways. Now we seek something different. And again, this does not mean that we should throw everything away, but that these myths are coming at things from a different perspective and providing that other side of the equation. So what are these perspectives that the hero um, provides? Often it is, war is stupid. I trust if you've watched a significant amount of anime, and particularly a significant amount of mecha series, that I do not need to justify this in great detail. This, this viewpoint that war is stupid is just everywhere. You know, war is incredibly wasteful and you know, kills lots of people. We just should never do it, right? That's a typical thing. But you also see another perspective, the idea that war is bad but sometimes necessary. This is the central conceit of Gundam Wing Endless Waltz. Now, obviously, this goes back to that idea that how do you sell a story in which, you are, in which people are fighting each other other than by saying, well, they're defending themselves, and defending themselves is great. But this is a remarkable perspective from a cult country that had the experiences it had in World War II. And when I say that, allow me to quote 
from the Japanese Constitution as it was signed in the late 40s in Article 9. The Japanese people forever renounce war as a sovereign right of the nation. No conditions. That's it. Land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. Period. No conditions. War is stupid. And yet, this is also the country that, as of two years ago, was the eighth highest spending on its defense budget in the world. Among all countries, Japan spent the eighth most on its military budget compared to everyone else. An equivalent of uh, 46, US, 46 billion US dollars. Because Japan lives in a very dangerous part of the world where there are some dangerous people about. Um, and so it does not have land, sea, and air forces, but it has self-defense forces. And that is what that money goes to. And so Japan is a, an exemplary example, you get what I mean, of this tension between war being seen as terrible and renouncing war while also understanding the need to respond to conflicts. And that comes out in their stories and in their, their anime in this case. Now, I talked about the hero's journey before. I want to come back to that. But that's going to have to be the next video. Hope you found this useful. See you next time.